Hi. I just wanted to tell you a quick story about um, some time that I spent with Dr. Tinker. As you know, he was on my dissertation committee, my um, comprehensive committee, and also way back in the beginning part of my education, he was an independent study while I was in Chicago and he was in Colorado. Um, as the summer approached and our, our class had ended, he let me know that he was gonna be uh, in Oklahoma on the Osage Reservation with his family and that he would love it if I came and uh, got to meet him in person. So we arranged to do that and I brought my daughter who was in middle school at the time. She, uh, she was going through a phase where she didn't talk a lot, especially to strangers. And so I was a little apprehensive about what she was gonna be like around this you know, professor that I so admired. And so we, we drove up, it was a beautiful summer day. He was there with his family and he had such a presence, uh, a nurturing presence, a uh, sense of humor, and he was very gracious. And I just remember sitting there with him and he said something to my daughter, asked her a simple question. And the next thing I knew, she was speaking, she was talking, she was engaged, she wasn't intimidated. Um, she didn't do her usual one syllable word. Um, and that was the kind of gracious and just welcoming sense that you have around Dr. Tinker. And so today, again, it is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Tinker. A good day to you, my relatives. I want to talk to you in the second lecture about something pretty discreet about the concept of worldview and difference and try to use that as a way of, of clarifying what it is that makes American Indian people so radically different from Euro-Christian peoples. I'm going to use worldview in a very discreet way, uh, in a technical way, and I ask you to hang with me as I do that, but I want to start in a rather unusual place that may seem like it's leading us astray a bit. I want to talk about a trip that I made to Oklahoma 16 years ago in 2004 at the invitation of one of my mentors, a Muskogee pastor by the name of Harry Long and his nephew, another Methodist uh, uh, clergyman, Kenneth Deer, both of whom are now gone. Uh, Harry was my mentor. Kenneth was a very close colleague and friend and, and worked out of the uh, National Office of the United Methodist Church in the uh, General Commission on Religion and Race. Harry and Ken wanted me to spend the weekend with them in their home community church talking about traditional American Indian spirituality. This is Salt Creek Methodist Church out in the middle of the farmland uh, just north of Holdenville surrounded by farm fields. It's the only uh, building structure within sight as you approach it. We drove north out of Holdenville on a narrow, thin uh, Oklahoma blacktop for about five miles, turned off that road onto a gravel farm road and drove another three or four miles and uh, came up to a crossroads of two of these uh, gravel farm roads. And there on the southeast corner, was Salt Creek Church with fields behind it, fields on each of the other corners of the intersection uh, around it. The Muskogees call it Salt Creek Community, yet the church are the only buildings visible 
anywhere around. Uh, the people live in other places, obviously. But when I walked that Friday afternoon into the church building itself, it was filled to capacity as it was on Saturday and into Sunday morning for my workshop on traditional Indian spirituality. Here I was engaging them in a conversation about those very things that missionaries had spent 200 years explaining to them were evil, barbaric, savage, and uncivilized, and they were there to be a part of the conversation. In order to warm up the audience a little bit, I joked with them and noted that they lived nearly equidistant between Stillwater and Norman, the two big university towns. So I asked them, uh, which football team do you root for? Are you cowboy fans or cheater fans? And of course, you have to be from Oklahoma to know that the word sooner actually means cheater. A man in the back of the room stood up to answer me uh, and got very serious. And he said, take for the price they pay athletic coaches at those two universities, we could have one heck of an Indian education program across the state of Oklahoma. And I knew immediately it was right because I had read in a newspaper the week before that Bob Stoops, the football coach at Oklahoma, back then, 17, 16 years ago, was earning over $2 million a year. Uh, there is, that's 10 times, more than 10 times what any full professor might earn even in a business department or, or, or a, law, a law school. The other thing I can tell you about this Salt Creek community is that it is not the only Methodist Indian community church out there in the middle of those fields. Indeed, there are four or five churches around Salt Creek, all within about a four-mile radius from one another, all separate and discreet, all historic churches with, you know, w w with faithful communities that gather around uh, persistently for uh, Sunday services and other uh, festivals that they mark during the if they were Euro-Christian white rural churches or even urban churches, suburban churches, the denominational hierarchy would have been working on them for years to get them to join up, merge, and become one larger church. It's just inefficient to have four pastors paying, or five pastors paying five salaries um, and getting five smaller groups together on Sunday. Uh, certainly we've seen why churches merging and forming larger churches pretty persistently uh, over time. But these are Indian communities. And their structure as community predates the ethnic cleansing and forced removal instituted by that Presbyterian president, Andrew Jackson, the most hated, I think, of all American presidents by Indians. Uh, their sense of community goes back to discrete communities in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, long before they were forced in that long march into Oklahoma. And they've maintained their sense of community now for almost two centuries since that removal, since that forced march. And it's not surprising that they chose to maintain that communityness by moving uh, outside of the towns and cities, the agency towns, 
and into the open country where they can, in fact, maintain their Indianness as well by being closer to the land, out in the open, where they can be in relationship with the cosmic whole of life around them. So at this point, we have two critical distinctions between uh, a native worldview and that of Euro-Christians. Um, spatiality in the land on the one hand and communityism uh, on the other hand versus the temporality uh, and individualism of the Euro-Christian West. Euro-Christian temporality can be measured in stuff like hourly wage structures in the business world, in business plans because uh, uh, no corporation will would dare undertake the investment of large sums of money without having a clear temporal plan for how the plan will be implemented. And then we have language aphorisms in English like time is money. Uh, and then it extends to religious notions, of course, like salvation and eschatology. On the other hand, American Indian spatiality is measured in terms of relationship, first of all. It's the relationship to place. So across the uh, Indian world of Turtle Island from Canada, across the United States, we're seeing today the spread of this, uh, the, the renewal of this spread of a land back movement as Indians are clamoring to say they want their land back. One thing we need to note here is that American Indian people are asking for something very different from what other people of color are asking for. Other people of color are asking for inclusion in the systemic whole of Euro, the Euro-Christian world. They, they, they want a fair shake in that system. I, Indian people are asking for their culture back, for their relationship to the cosmos back, for the land back. And, and we need to be really clear here that land back does not mean property. This is another key difference between the, the two worldviews. From the very beginning, of the Euro-Christian invasion. As Euro-Christians went about almost immediately uh, to the task of converting the native to Christianity, to their religious structure, to their notion of civilization, to uh, notions like wearing wool pants and, 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 and cotton blouses, they also went about immediately converting land, the whole earth, into property. And there's a book by that title, Land into Property, uh, that you can look at. Spatiality and relationship to the land indicates something much broader than just rootedness in a particular piece of land, although it quite indicates that, but it's about that relationship between the human community and the other than human life forms around us. So it's actually a relationship with the earth as mother, with the land as the manifestation of that mother Hood of, uh, of the earth. It, it, it's about relationship with all our relatives that live on that land, on the earth, about our relationship with not just the buffalo and the squirrels and, and the bunnies, which we have a surfeit of in our green belt here in the town home where we live, 
It's more than a relationship with the eagles and the sparrows and the hummingbirds, but it's a relationship with the trees, with the mountains, or if you're from Oklahoma, the hills, with the rivers and the creeks, the stones that you find on the banks of the creek side, all of those relatives are alive and in relationship with us. And we don't take at will any of it without giving something in return and having words uh, of relationship with even that which we take. If we collect firewood, we have to give something back, usually tobacco. If we pick cedar, we give something back. Again, quite often tobacco. If we pick tobacco, then we might burn cedar in return for the tobacco that we take. Everything has to be done in harmony and balance with the whole community of the cosmic realm around us. That's a little different than just relationship with aunts and uncles, nephews and nieces. Think for a minute, what is the purpose of life or of any uh, endeavor uh, in the civil world around us? What's the goal of life? Of course, when people hit retirement age, the goal might be to make it successfully to the end. That, that is in some comfort to make sure that you have good health to the end and to make sure you have financial resources to pay for health care and enough money to last you until the end of your life. The, the difficult part is not knowing exactly how much money you need because you don't know exactly how long you're going to live. Well, you can immediately see how difficult that is for many Americans who uh, don't have the resources to wealth that, that others have, and hence can't make those plans in any useful way. For younger people, <coughs> the goal might be to have a good career, a great career, to max out in one's earnings and to secure surplus wealth. That, that was the goal designed by English philosopher uh, John Locke in the late 17th century. Today, of course, even for younger kids, the goal is, like my daughter in kindergarten, to get her college ready, or, or in school, public schools generally, to do outcomes assessment in order to measure student progress. State legislatures have now heavily meddled in, in uh, uh, the education uh, world with their intense interest in this bizarre notion of school testing. For natives, the goal is much simpler. It is and always has been balance and harmony. Personal balance, first of all. So we do things and engage in ceremony for the purpose of creating personal balance, family balance, community balance, so that there are community-wide ceremonies to restore balance in a community. And eventually, the interest is in cosmic world balance. And I keep saying to restore balance because we human beings, by living life, automatically are involved in disrupting balance. For instance, I've said all life forms in the cosmos around me are my close relatives. Yet at the same time, in order to stay alive, I must eat every day 
And as I eat, I'm eating my own relatives, whether it's deer meat or beef, turkey or chicken, whether it's corn, beans, and squash. A, a friend of mine, a colleague at Ilef, was a Buddhist. Uh, he and I had a classic argument that went on in front of a class every year, uh, and we enjoyed the argument. He was a, a, a Buddhist in the Tibetan tradition of the Dalai Lama, so he was a vegetarian because in their sect, at least of Buddhism, <coughs> they're strict vegetarians because they don't want to harm any sentient being. And my constant comeback year after year was Jose. What is it about corn that you find to be not sentient? Because you see corn, beans, and squash are our mothers. They're the three sisters for Indians across Turtle Island. They're close relatives whom we have permission to cultivate in gardens to harvest and to eat, but we don't do any of that without ceremony, ceremony to plant, ceremony to harvest, ceremony to cook, and even to eat. Because eating our relatives creates imbalance. It fractures the world. And our job as humans then is to give back, to do something to restore that balance. Indian peoples across the continent had annual ceremonies to restore world balance once a year. Here in eastern Oklahoma, among the five civilized tribes, that annual ceremony was called green corn. On the plains further to the west and north, the ceremony was called Sundance. And in those Sundances, and I've participated in a, a, a number of those Sundances uh, with La, my Lakota relatives, there are always a host of white New Agers who show up and want to dance because they want the personal individual experience of having sacrificed themselves in order to increase their own spiritual growth progress, development, all those white temporal notions, right? Whereas for Indian people, that's not what is at stake in these world renewal ceremonies. Rather, one dances in a sun dance. For all those people who stand under the arbor around the sun dance circle, in the shade, eating three meals a day and having plenty to drink so they don't get sunstroke, while the dancers dance four days with no food and no water, what we call a dry fast. Yet the dancers are dancing for all those under the arbor who might be too old or too young to dance. They're dancing for the community that their dancing might bring good health, harmony, and balance back in to the community. At mealtimes, as in a host of other everyday ceremonies, balance is restored by offering food to all of our relatives, both those that produce the food, corn, beans, squash, those three mothers, or, or uh, elk, or moose, beef, whatever we're eating. And for all of our relatives who are in the Wanahi world, because we want to continue to have a relationship with them to restore the balance and harmony between those of us who live in this world and those who live in that Wanahi world. That way, we're free to eat and restore our own nutrition at the same time, maintaining harmony and balance 
with those relatives whom we have used for food. I have a 12 year old daughter these days who came to me when she was four years old. Uh, she happens to be a different clan than I. I told you in my first lecture that I'm Eagle Clan. She's Tonka Tawanton, that is Buffalo Bull Clan. As Buffalo Bull Clan, she's proscribed from eating buffalo meat because the clan's job was to maintain that relationship of balance with the Buffalo Nation so that the rest of the Osage Nation could eat. She has learned from my brother, that's her grandpa, direct descendant, to respect that relationship and that responsibility. And she convinced me when she was four years old that as long as she's in my house, I need to respect her obligation so that uh, we no longer serve buffalo meat, which is, after all, my favorite meat in my home. One time when she was five, we were in a restaurant in Vail, Colorado, and I noticed that the sausage was buffalo sausage and I really wanted it. And she turned to me and said, Dad, you promised me. And I immediately remembered that even in a restaurant, when I'm with my daughter, I cannot do that. So I, I, I ordered uh, the veal steaks instead. Another more everyday ceremony is what we Osages call Iungli, sitting with the stones. Uh, your Christians tend to call it in English sweat lodge, although I assure them Osages don't sweat, we perspire. Uh, but sweat lodge, or Iungli, sitting with the stones, is a relationship that can be done at any time in order to restore balance and harmony both in the self, in the, in the community, and in the larger community around us. It involves quite a bit of time, however, since uh, we have to go out and build a fire and place sufficient stones on the fire to get the lodge warm, uh, cover the lodge with covering so that it's completely dark inside and insulated from any outside air that might prematurely cool the rocks. And then in the dark of that lodge, we pour water on the hot stones and create steam so that uh, some folk have said, oh, it's kind of like a sauna, except I've been in lots of saunas and I've never prayed in a sauna. And yet this Iungli ceremony is about opening that portal between our world and the Wanagi world so that we can invite the Wanagi in and have conversation with them. For nearly 20 years, I took on the responsibility of traveling to prisons, federal prisons, uh, uh, and state prisons. I started in San Quentin in California, uh, federal prisons, especially here in Colorado and uh, in the state of Colorado. Actually, I was a part of in 1985, 86, 87, part of building the first uh, Iungli structures, uh, sweat lodges in all of the state of Colorado's men's uh, Department of Correction facilities. And I would go in about once a month, help the men, talk to them, encourage them, support them. And what I discovered is that they were in prison almost invariably for offenses that occurred while they were inebriated or, or increasingly as time went on, uh, under the influence of drugs. In other words, they were perfectly fine human beings as long as they were sober 
and became great friends. But I would always worry every time they came close to release because I knew they faced the challenge of that wicked behavioral problem called addiction. But in Sweat Lodge, they were able to recover the Indian self or even in, in a state facility where there were urban Indians, rediscover the Indian self. That is to rediscover Indian identity and begin to live it inside prison walls and to live it especially in this uh, once a week ceremony typically in, in prisons called, uh, called Sweat Lodge, Iungli uh, and Osage. Uh, uh, and typically these ceremonies take about two hours of preparation, minimal, in order to build the fire and heat the rocks. They have to cook for a minimum of about an hour, it seems, in order to get red hot. Then once, once we all go into the lodge, the length of the ceremony depends actually on how much people have to say. Yeah, there are songs that are sung, ceremonial acts performed, but the length of the ceremony depends mostly on how long each person speaks because we live in an egalitarian culture. I'll say more about that in a minute so that everyone in the lodge gets the chance to speak as long as that person needs to speak. By the time the people in the lodge are done doing and saying the things they need to do and say, the whole crew from the beginning to end, building the fire to taking down the covers off the lodge, we may have spent five to seven hours out at the site for ceremony. Since a fire is sine qua non, the ceremonial grounds usually have to be at some distance outside of the urban center uh, where fire codes are less strict and allow for a large enough fire uh, to eat 30 to 40 significantly large, fairly large stones. And then we have maybe a 20 or 30 minute drive each way to get out to the to the place. That's a significant temporal uh, uh, commitment that each of us has to make. It takes virtually a whole day. Compare that with downtown and prime suburban locations for uh, uh, mainline denominational churches and even the new mega churches, where real estate location is of primary importance and where time schedules are economically even more important than real estate. Uh, I tell my students at Isle School of Theology, Protestant students, that if they don't learn to do a liturgy in 59 minutes, I'm afraid their church denominational hierarchy is going to have them uh, reassigned somewhere out on the state line and away from the big city churches and big suburban churches uh, because uh, their moneymakers uh, need to make sure that they don't alienate temporally oriented people whose, whose backsides are only accustomed to uh, that 59 minute commitment. All of this is part of what I mean by the concept of worldview. By worldview, I mean that automatic framing of the world around us that is pre-linguistic and emerges from the subconscious. I distinguish it radically from ideology, and I know that a lot of my more liberal students at Iliff, uh, white students, have bought into ideologies that move them towards Native American worldview, but that's not the same as a Native American worldview. It's a good first step, but it's only an ideological shift. For instance, 
the uh, Euro-Christian world functions out of what I call, and, and cognitive linguists have identified it too, as an up-down image schema. That is an idealized cognitive model that resides here in the back of the mind that generates notions of reality that are hierarchical. That's how the world is organized in the subconscious of this Euro-Christian uh, worldview of the up-down image schema. There's always a city hall or a mayor that you have to get some permission from. There's always a CEO or a manager above you to whom you are accountable. There's always a minister in the church or, or above the minister, a conference minister or district superintendent or bishop. Uh, and even if someone starts their own independent church, it's going to have the same up-down image structure. One of the mega churches I looked at in Colorado Springs has not only a senior pastor, but an executive pastor, and then a whole slew of uh, pastoral staff below that. It's the most natural thing to have that up-down image schema at play. And then people see it even organizing the natural world of, uh, of, of animals and wolves, etc. And that up-down image schema then encompasses everything we've been talking about, individualism, Euro-Christian individualism, temporality, the notion of private property. Uh, you cannot have a notion of private property without some hierarchical governing structure to organize the ownership of property and keep track of it and, and to also govern the uses of that property to tell people what they can do and what they can't do with their property. And that's why we could not build a fire downtown in Denver, but had to find a ceremonial grounds outside of the city. Compare that with what I said about American Indian people's uh, communityism, their sense of community in a technical sense, their, their spatiality and land uh, attachment, the earth and the land back movement. It's what I call a collateral egalitarian image structure instead of the up down, collateral egalitarian. In that collateral egalitarian worldview, uh, we're looking at a situation where there simply are not any bosses, as one of my colleagues, uh, a Shawnee a scholar, explained. Yet we did have these people who in English are translated as being chiefs. The Osage word is Gaiga. Maybe you can understand what I'm saying when I say there are no bosses, when I suggest that in the Osage village in the old days, there was never a single Gaiga, never an autocrat, but always two Gaiga, one from each of the divisions, the sky division and the earth division. And they took turns every other day of being in charge, kind of like having Donald Trump on Mondays and Hillary Clinton on Tuesdays, if you can wrap your mind around that uh, kind of a, a, a method. So Indian people still today have trouble imagining this up-down image schema and learning how to acknowledge it uh, and invoke it and, 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 and use it to their own advantage. Because for us, everything is in this collateral egalitarian plane. As a human being, I am not in any way superior to the buffalo, my daughter's clan animal, or to the eagle, my clan animal, or to the rabbits that run rampant 
uh, across our lawn because uh, your Christians in the city have managed to kill all the wolves and chase off most of the coyotes who control the rapid population in harmony and balance beforehand. No, we find ourselves equal with the corn we harvest for food, equal with the elk we shoot for supper, equal with the tree we cut down for ceremony, or the saplings we cut down to build homes in the old traditional way, or, 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 or even the trees we cut down for firewood, even if they're dead wood. We always have to give something back in order to take our relatives into our home in order to use for fun. So now I can come back to where we began in lecture one, and I can suggest that the oppression of native peoples on Turtle Mountain today is deeply systemic. It resides in that deep framing mental construct of the colonizer. At some level, the colonizer is perfectly, con perpetually confused as to why Indians have failed to comply with the systemic whole, failed to comply and find our place uh, in the hierarchy, uh, invariably down near the bottom. Some are simply aghast and can't seem to figure us out. And they continue to insist on education as the solution, the answer. Or they insist new governments are the, uh, are, are, are the answer. New, new federal policies and new local governments for Indian people. A new business model, that's the answer. The others, the radical white supremacists and Christian nationalists, just get angry. And when they get angry, they manage to get violent because our failure in their eyes means that we are simply less than. We are abhorrent, abject in their eyes. And hence their violence is justified. Historically, Indians failed to understand the Euro-Christian propertyization of the earth. Hence, destruction and eradication was then the Christian response. The consequence, punish the savages, was the U.S. Army's cry and, and, and territorial governor's cry across, across the West. Euro-Christians always needed more land and native peoples were in the way. And of course today, Euro-Christians still need Indian land because that's where the mineral wealth of the continent is that's left yet to plunder and extricate. So building pipelines across Indian land, building copper mines on Indian land is the rule of the day. Remember Donald Trump gave a substantial piece of land sacred to the San Carlos Apache to an Australian copper mining firm so that they could take, remove a whole mountain to get at the enormous billion dollar copper well underneath that mountain. Of course, the San Carlos response and the Indian response generally across the continent is that mountain has as much right to live as I have, as much right to live as the President of the United States has. Leave it alone. Leave the copper underground where it belongs. That's where the Creator put it. That's where it's supposed to be. Learn to live in harmony and balance with that mountain because that mountain in the Apache uh, uh, schema of the world is the earth 
reaching up to make contact with the sky so that earth and sky can be in harmony and balance with one another. So as I bring my lectures to a close, I don't wish you success or progress or development. I can only wish you balance and harmony. But having said that much, I challenge you to explain that to the military industrial complex. If you're in the business world, explain it to your boss or to your CEO. <clears throat> and if you're in politics, explain it to the hierarchy above you. For those of you who are in church, you have those people in your congregations, you can explain it to them. <laughs> Good luck in that. And I mean that seriously. Good luck as you explore harmony and balance instead of success and development. Kakuna, uita wadonde kide thane.